Space. So walk into the operating room and you see this, this, this intimidating rack of instruments that look like a bunch of scissor handles. Uh, and that's when the first time I was in an operating room um, in, uh, in when I was actually very young, my father was an anesthesiologist, so I got to fish out of him in the, in the operating room. And I looked in the back of the back table, and there was just a bunch of scissors. And why, do you, why, have, why do you have all these scissors? Well, you know, they're not all scissors, obviously. They are designed for handling, and the scissor handling and the handles of these instruments are, are all designed to be able to maximize the, the uh, mechanical use of our hands for the, for the execution of the movements with the instruments. So what we're going to go over now, we'll review are essentially all of these instruments in relative order. Um, now there are a lot of instruments and there's some nuances to these instruments and so we'll go through all of them. Uh, there are a lot of eponyms and there are a lot of cross eponyms between, between the instruments we'll go over. Uh, this is, will not be perfect in terms of its description uh, as, I, as I mentioned at the outset. Um, but again, if we just capture the theme and capture the principles of what we use the instruments for, uh, that's really the intent of this, uh, of this talk. So the first thing we'll go over are actually uh, our towel clips. Uh, towel clips. What do we use towel clips for? In most surgical sets now, the drapes that go on the abdomen are either adhesive, maybe we can just stick them to the skin, or we use traditional cloth towels and we use skin staplers to hold them together. Uh, but before there was this ubiquitous adhesive disposable material, and we used reusable towels, uh, we had to have some way to hold those towels on the surgical field. So as we squared off the surgical field, we would take what's called a penetrating towel clip, Penetrating towel clamp does exactly that. It penetrates the, through the towel and holds the towel in place. It will also penetrate the skin. It will also penetrate through your finger. Uh, so generally, here, Kevin, Kevin no, joking. So the idea is, is that if you, if if the the intent behind this is 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 safety, so be very careful when you're when you're handling penetrating towel clips. Penetrating towel clips can be used for any number of things. It can be used for, in addition to holding towels, it can be used for skin retraction. Every once in a while with small fractures, or orthopedic surgeons will actually use this to reduce a fracture since it has good grip and it's sharp. It can be used to hold bone together. Um, so they can be used for any number of purposes. But penetrating towel clips, notice that they come in fours, uh, in a set of four, and the set of fours to be able to complete squaring off a surgical field with four towels. All of the towels being held together by a penetrating towel clip. Um, interestingly enough, you can use penetrating towel clips to grasp and elevate the abdominal wall. Uh, for laparoscopy or otherwise, that can be used to elevate and, uh, and lift up the abdominal wall for various needle insertion or OptiView insertion. Uh, so recognize that instruments can be used in multiple, for multiple purposes, both for, both for open and laparoscopic surgery. Uh, next, if we have penetrating towel clamps, we must have non-penetrating towel clamps. So non-penetrating towel clamps are designed for exactly that. They do not penetrate the drape. They're designed to hold loops and or folds in the, in, in the surgical drape, and frequently we use this to hold our, um, the, the items that have to be passed off the field or connected off the field. For example, the electrocautery unit, the suction, uh, if you use any type of special energy device, the cords that, that, are, um, the cords that are connected to those devices generally run off the table. How do we keep those cords from falling off the table? How do we route them so that they don't fall off the table? Generally speaking, non-penetrating towel clamps are the instruments we use to do that. They can also be used to make essentially little folds, little pockets on the side of the, on the, side of the table. To This, once again, is another place where, where instrumentation, fluid, dra um, uh, laparotomy sponges or ratex sponges are, can be captured and not fall off the field, causing problems with your counsel. So now those are our towel clips. We're going to move on next to scissors. And scissors, again, this, so we'll start with the next, the num after retractors, the next most important instrument from a medical student perspective is suture scissors. So suture scissors have, also have an eponym. This is, these are uh, called mayo scissors, or straight mayo scissors. Uh, they tend to be heavier scissors. They're not designed to cut tissue. They're designed to cut suture designed to cut suture, designed to cut uh, dressing materials. Uh, that is what, that's what straight mayo scissors are designed to use. Now, a quick thing on, on gripping and utilization of the suture scissor, um, important. So recognize, and regardless of what you've kind of practiced in anatomy lab or otherwise, there is uh, one of the first rules I tell my, our students, rather, 
in, in our labs is that, you know, there are lots of rules in general surgery, but as a student, the last thing you want to do is, uh, you don't want to look like a dork, is the bottom line. So when, how you hold your instruments uh, basically conveys your knowledge of how the tools work. And so essentially, when we talk about holding a suture scissor or really any of these instruments, they are designed essentially for your ring finger to go in one hole and your thumb to go in the second hole. With regard to the scissors, we always try to use the, with the bolt of the scissors facing up because that's where the friction between the tines of the scissors is mediated. So essentially, if you put your index finger over the, over the bolt and the scissors, ring finger and thumb, you're going you're gonna to be able to exert the maximum friction between these tines. And even with the dullest scissors, you're going to be able to cut, your, cut the suture for, for the surgery that you're performing. Understand that when you're cutting suture as a medical student, just accept the fact that what you cut will always be either too long or too short. That's just understand that that is, that is what, that's what's going to happen and take it with a grain of salt. Um, it's all, it will always be that way. But knowing, and how, knowing how to handle the instrument is important. This is an instrument that should remain in your hand as a medical student so that you're ready to go. Cut suture, stay involved in the case, stay engaged. If there are straight Mayo scissors, there must be curved Mayo scissors. Now, curved Mayo scissors are, um, are, are actually designed to be tissue scissors. These are generally designed to, for, for cutting, cutting through and debriding tissues. We frequently use this for heavy tissue debridement. Um, they're very effective in doing that. Um, but remember, we, and then as much as possible, we try to preserve this for cutting tissue rather than, uh, rather than gauze or suture, which tends to dull the blades faster. So curved Mayo scissors, again, heavy or heavy, more like more heavy tissue debridement type scissors curved Mayo scissors, again, designed to be held the same way. The next set of scissors we'll, uh, we'll go over, and actually, let me, let me skip to these. So if there are short suture scissors or, or Mayo scissors, there must be long ones. So here we demonstrate long Mayo scissors just designed to cut suture, not tissue, cut suture in a deep hole. So say we're tying off, and, uh, tying off a short gastric vessel and doing an open, doing an open case, that's in a deep, dark hole, we're not going to be able to reach that with the short suture scissors, but rather with the long suture scissors, so long suture scissors. The next set of scissors that come in the pack, there's a long and the short, these are Metzenbaum scissors. Metzenbaum scissors are curved by design. They are designed as tissue scissors. And it's very important to understand tissue scissors means that you want the blades to be sharp, and you do not want them to be dulled by cutting suture or other material. So generally speaking, we try to preserve either the short Metzenbaum scissors or METS, long Metzenbaum scissors or METS. We use them all exclusively for tissue dissection and cutting. Um, and this can be, this is used ubiquitously throughout surgery, general surgery, cardiothoracic, urology, GYN. Everyone uses Metzenbaum scissors for sharp dissection. Sharp dissection where we don't want to use energy devices, the, essential, the, the tool most commonly used our Mets and Bounce scissors. So knowing and understanding the name and what it's used for and recognize that we avoid as much as possible to, uh, to avoid cutting anything but tissue with Mets and Bounce scissors. Next we're going to move on to needle drivers. And so needle drivers, um, if, I, if I can offer a, offer a few things in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, practice tips as medical students, opening and closing a needle driver will essentially train your hand and your mind to be able to uh, to do this essentially unconsciously. What I ask my students to do, and we usually will give them a disposable needle driver from a practice central line kit or the like, put it in everybody's lab coat pocket, and, and then ask the question, how many times should you open and close that instrument during this rotation? Um, and there were a few people throughout out the number, but over the course of six weeks, it's completely feasible while you're walking on rounds, waiting for cases and other things to open and close that instrument 10,000 times. And there's a reason that 10,000 numbers out there, it, it leads you to expertise. And if you have expertise in opening and closing a needle driver, you establish the same expertise in opening and closing surgical instruments. And you can do that and it becomes part of your, your psychomotor lexicon in terms of what you can do. So with that said, the progression in terms of handling instruments. So generally when we start, we start handling needle driver here for an example, but it will apply to all of these instruments, is you, you start with the ring finger, in, in one of the finger holders and thumb in the other, and essentially using your entire hand to open and close the instrument. Progress and, and notice, especially with needle driver, if both of your fingers are inside 
are, are within the are within the instrument, it does limit the rotation that can be applied to the tip of the instrument when it's holding a needle. Now that that does limit your rotation, the national the natural supination and pronation of the wrist you know, are, is limited. So what can I do, and how can I better in, improve the rotation of my wrist? Well, what I can do is I can take I can take my thumb out of one of these holes and replace it with the thenar eminence of my uh, of my hand. And so essentially, the next step would be partially palming the instrument. So now I can open and close the instrument. I maintain my ring finger here, and I progress to where now, all of a sudden, I'm rotating the instrument, uh, the the needle driver back an additional 90 degrees. So I can establish and rotate the instrument back, enter the tissues with the needle at 90 degrees, and establish good suturing technique. As I get better, and as I start to understand how the instrument fits in my hand, eventually I can get to the, to the, to the step where I can use the hypothenar eminence of my hand on one side, the thenar eminence of my hand on the other side, and I can palm the instrument opening and closing, essentially giving me 360 degree rotation of the instrument be able to open and close as I need. So the progression with regard to handling the needle driver is working from working from an open and close here to open and close a partial palming to where you can completely palm the instrument and open and close without putting your fingers in the instrument. It can save time, it can save energy, it makes you more efficient in the operating room, but it's not something that will come overnight and requires practice. So you'll notice that there is a there is a there is a there are a multitude rather of, of needle drivers here and say, hey, what, so are all needle drivers made the same? Well, clearly the answer is no, and they're used, for, they're used for different purposes. Generally speaking, the longer the needle driver, the more delicate the needle that you're going to apply to it. And then a discussion on needles will be, uh, and suture material will be another talk. Uh, but remember that the more delicate the needle driver, the smaller the needle that you're going to put in that instrument. So one of, the, one of the easy ways to know and understand what kind of needle you should put, pick up in the instrument is actually the tone of closing the instrument. So if I close this instrument, it gives a high pitched tone. If I move to a, to a stouter instrument, it gives a dull pitched tone. It's essentially telling me that it's designed as a heavier instrument. And everything that there's, and there's every variation in between. Another poor man's way to differentiate what is used for fine instruments is, and not is actually the gold handles tend to be for more delicate needles, tend to be. Uh, for example, this is a non-gold handle and this is a very delicate needle driver. But in general, the gold handle ones tend to lean towards more, more, delicate, uh, more delicate needles, while this, the plain tip handles tend to be for more heavy handling uh, needles. But remember, that's not, a, that's not a universal principle. Again, key things to know is notice the difference in length. Obviously, we're sewing in a deep, dark hole. We want, a, we want a long needle driver to be able to apply the suture. When we're closing the fascia, we're closing the skin, we will requisitely need shorter needle drivers. It will provide a much better lever arm, give us the mechanical advantage, advantage especially closing an abdominal wall, that you need, a, you need a stout needle driver to hold a big needle to drive through the, to drive through the abdominal wall. So these are needle drivers. <laughs>